we'd like to welcome you. If you're viewing from home, we're in uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 23 today. Isaiah 1, 1 through 23. And uh, <clears throat> this is lesson three in the workbook, if you have your workbook. I'm emphasizing that because we weren't here last weekend, so I think I'm on the right page. <clears throat> I think we got up to, um, <clears throat> we did lesson one and two. We're examining the book of Isaiah, and uh, there's a lot of what I'd call backdrop to the book, or this study, which is interesting. And before we get started, though, we'll do as we normally do, we'll open with prayer. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day that we could gather together, call ourselves Christians, call ourselves disciples and students of your word. And as we examine the scriptures today, we're reminded to pay attention to your word and follow your word and not the words of men. Father, we ask you to be with those that are sick, those that are healing, Marta, Elizabeth, Richard, <clears throat> Larry, others that we've been praying hard for, our loved ones that within our families that we hold close to our heart. We believe in the power of prayer. We believe that we supplicate to you. You hear our prayer. As always, we think and pray for the will of you. I thank you, Lord, for allowing us the freedom to gather here without being molested. Forgive us when we don't consider our many blessings in this world that you've given us. We may always rest in Christ. And for us in Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to do something a little different today. We're going <clears> to <throat> not read all 23 verses of this first chapter. As, uh, as I've looked at this study, it's a little going back and forth. So if we read the whole section, I think we're going to lose the content of where we're at. But we are in the book of Isaiah. The first verse, uh, again to remind you, is this vision of Isaiah. And it's up on the screen here, the son of Amos. So Isaiah is a prophet. Uh, we keep bringing up Hebrews chapter 1, how God speaks to us. In the last days, he speaks to us through his son. But the, the era we're in right here, he's speaking to us through prophets. I'm going to remark on this a couple times. He seems to be addressing more than just these kings. In this first verse, he talks about he's addressing Judah. He's addressing, I believe, the children of Israel in Judah. In the past studies, it seems the prophets have gone to these kings, and I'm sure he's influencing Jotham, Asa, Hezekiah. And in this scene, he's somewhere between Isaiah and Hezekiah. But he seems to be talking directly to the people. And of course, these scriptures talk to us directly also. And there's certainly an application for us today. I encourage you to stay with me in the lesson book. <clears throat> We're on page 18. I try to follow close along with this commentary. Uh, I appreciate this because we could plow through the book of Isaiah and be here for a year. But what this commentary has done for us, and it's from the Fried Hardeman book store, store, I believe. Isn't that Fried Hardeman we get this from? Thank you. Gospel Advocate, okay. Gospel Advocate, we, it's a trusted source of commentary. And again, I'll remark again, we don't trust everything in the commentary, but we look at this as a summary. We're going to summarize this book, and they're going to bring out points in this commentary. So if you study your commentary during the week, you can rely on the fact that I'm going to try to cover it pretty closely. And so you've got a good study. And so I know when I was in college, uh, one of my harder classes was organic chemistry. Sounds hard. Uh, 
Michael knows what organic chemistry is about. But it's, a, it's about the study of plants, animals, and everything that is existing. And they have a footprint. We call it a, a molecular, molecular configuration. We had to memorize all these things for the, our tests. But what I, try, what I liked about this professor is if you read the Bible, we called it the Bible of Organic Chemistry. It was about this thick. It was a huge book, and uh, but what he did is, if you read the book, you read the chapter, you could trust that he would examine you, and he'd lecture along the chapter, and he would test you along the chapter. And I learned a lot from that way of teaching, so I try to follow that here. So again, I encourage you to read and study every day during the week, whatever time is good for you. <clears throat> This commentary starts out with uh, the prophet Haggai in chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Haggai says, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but have not enough. Ye drink, but are not filled with drink. Ye clothe, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages, but put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And that is in the first section of your introduction. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the Lord God is asking us to consider what we're doing. Learn from me, Jesus says. Reflect on my words. Well, I was, Patty and I watched In Search of the Lord's Way this morning, and the lesson was uh, along the similar lines here. Jesus said, you call me master, but you don't obey my words. Uh, many will say, Lord, Lord, haven't I called upon you and fed those? He said, I knew you not. Paraphrasing real quick. And that's really what Haggai is saying here, and this is what Isaiah is going to also say here. We're going to go now and read the first section of Isaiah. And I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles or your electronic Bibles, you might open up to this book. Because we looked at the first verse just a second ago. I'm going to ask Gene now to read Isaiah 1, 2 through 5, and we're going to stop there and consider uh, these verses. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the doctor, the donkey, is master crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Alias sinful nation, the people laden with iniquity, the brought up evildoers, children who are corrupt, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backwards. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Okay. Thank you. Now, we really jumped over to page 19. Uh, in the beginning, a sinful nation. But I wanted to bring this up first and address these first set of scriptures. I think it kind of sets up the framework of what Isaiah is saying. And he says the same thing that Haggai said there, is that he's addressing the nation of Israel. He doesn't seem to be addressing uh, the king here. And notice the first or the second verse there, the first verse I have listed here, uh, the Lord says, hear, O heavens, and give ear. He, it's like he's asking the whole earth to listen to what he's saying. Because his people aren't listening. And notice he talks about this rebellion here. He calls upon the heaven and earth to bear witness against the children of Israel. And he's saying here, the Lord, he fed them. And I emphasize here, he feeds us with the word, the word of God. 
And in Haggai, we, talk, we just read about how you drink and you're not nourished. And Jesus, of course, says the same thing in the New Testament. As his disciples came back to him and said, Lord, Lord, what are you doing talking to this woman in the well? We brought food back. And he talks about the spiritual food and the spiritual water that he has to offer. And uh, again, this is what uh, Isaiah is saying here, I think. <clears throat> the nation of Israel is a sinful nation. Now we're talking about Israel and Judah. And they're laden with sin and iniquity. And they're a generation of evildoers. They're corrupt. And they've given in to purity. Israel abandoned the Lord. The Lord didn't abandon him, them. And now they've provoked him until he, until he becomes angry. Does the Lord ever change? Would be a question I ask the audience. Does God ever change? No. So this would be an admonition to us too, wouldn't it? He became angry. <clears throat> He's going forward, not backwards in progress. The enemies of Israel are already destroying Israel itself. The enemies are all around the people of Judah which, to God, they're all the nation of Israel. These things are happening in front of them. In a spiritual sense, it's the same thing with us, isn't it? We can see all kinds of things happening in front of us when we're not following God, but we can't see it. Or we don't want to see it. We're going to have Evelyn read next in our section of the introduction where we jump to the, towards the end of this reading. And this, again, is a framework for uh, our study today. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Thank you. Gene. The Lord has lots of patience with them. Uh, look how many times he gets mad at them. And he yeah. does have a lot of patience. The Lord has a lot of patience with them. Absolutely right. Look how... We, we looked at the last couple of lessons. I know it seems like many moons ago. But they were doing what we're going to see again today. They're worshiping other things besides God. God's a very jealous God. Okay, he's still patient with them. He's still sending prophets to them. We're going to look at that again today. Isaiah is one of many who are saying to them, wake up. And these are some of my favorite scriptures. Uh, we sing songs around this, these verses. Uh, Come now, let us reason together. And we're going to look at that. We just, in that first reading that Gene gave us, the ox, the donkey, can they reason? The cow out in the feed, can he reason? He or she? No. Sometimes we have animals that we think have some reasoning, but they, it's a conditioned response is what we're getting from them. They respond to certain tones in our voices, but God gave us the ability to think for ourselves. In the commentary here I read, I, 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 I think it's a good point that they bring out. This is not a, this is not a comment, this is not a suggestion that we argue with God about it. We need to think about what God's saying. And he's saying here, although your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. And that's another song we sing around those verses, don't we? When I was growing up, I don't think it's in our song book, we sang one called Whiter Than Snow. Whiter than snow. 
uh, <clears throat> but if you're willing to be obedient, it's not a relationship. It's not a discussion. It's about obeying. You shall eat good of the land. Again, it's a metaphor. And we know about the sword. Yes. I, you, you said it's a metaphor to the audience that Isaiah is writing to. This is 800 years before Jesus right. comes. Right. These were not metaphors to these people. This was something that was very realistic to them. Mm -hmm. They had seen their the land devoured with the sword. They had been attacked from other nations. Yes. They had gone out and fought. And they knew the history of if they were obedient, God was with them when they went into battle. Or if they were disobedient, God was not with them. And they, they knew the losses. And, and even when it came to this, their sins being as scarlet and their, their garments being as white as snow here, it was a very realistic representation to them. Because when they sinned, they were required to offer an animal sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And when they go out and they slaughter this calf as part of the sacrifice, they're going to get this blood all over their garments, and it's not going to come out. They were permanently stained from these sacrifices that they were making for their sins, and God is telling them in a very realistic way, you don't have to do this. Be obedient to me. So to the audience that Isaiah is originally writing to, it was something very realistic and tangent that they could, yep. they could see in front of them. You, uh, you brought up a lesson one time that really made it vivid where the priests would have robes on and they would go in and sacrifice. Imagine us having to come in and sacrifice a lamb. And the cutting and the blood, and it would go all over. They would walk through it. You said their robes would be drugged through the blood. So that would be very vivid. That red crimson blood, as blood is exposed to the air, it turns bright red. It's purple inside of us. And uh, they would remember that as they're sacrificing. Very good point. Very good point, yes. And that's, again, it's fluid through the New Testament where <clears throat> the same thing happens here. In Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, then we present ourselves as a living sacrifice acceptable to God. And so not only is it something in worship we should be doing but it's how we conform ourselves to the world and the application was the same to the Israelites 800 years ago they were not only corrupting the way they were worshiping God but the way they were living to God but they thought they were doing everything okay they thought they were acceptable to God and yes the world was breaking down around them uh, in a most tangible way. And they were, just like Paul says here, they were being transformed to the world. They were acting like the world around them. And he says, transform yourself. And we transform ourselves by the uh, word of God. So that's kind of the introduction if you follow along in this commentary. I tried to uh, cover most of that. He, I believe in this commentary, well, I won't say that. Some, some of this he goes back into the, uh, or, or somebody goes back into Genesis. I don't know if that's this lesson or the next lesson, but. <clears throat> The first section is sinful nation. 
The vision of Isaiah contains prophecies of Isaiah, the son of Amos. Uh, it seems he ministered between 740 to 680 BC. They call that the eighth cent later the part of the eighth, cent eighth century. For about 20 years, he spoke to both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Israel, we would call Judah. After the fall of the Syrians in 722 BC, Isaiah continued to prophesy to Judah. So somewhere along all this going on, they actually know about the fall of Israel, the northern kingdom, who had already decided to practice and worship God their own way instead of the way God commanded them. And this is part of uh, this sinful nation. They go back into some of this introduction on page 20. <clears throat> uh, this period of Israel's history, and we were in 2 Kings when we began this study, 15, 16, 17, and it says all the way through 21. 2 Chronicles 26 to 33, you can also read about this. So again, God tells us twice, at least through these books of this story. There's contemporary prophets, Hosea, Hosea, Micah. And uh, it says by the time Isaiah, the prophets, Elijah, Elisha, Obadiah, Joel, Jonah, and Amos had already completed their ministry. So when you look at the Old Testament, and they, these would be called minor prophets, when you're reading these books, you can sort of understand a framework. These prophets were talking to probably mo more like the Northern Kingdom. <clears throat> By this time, Israel had been in the Promised Land for almost 700 years. The first 400 in Canaan, when judges ruled Israel. And again, when you look in the book of Judges, you can see those people. We've talked about this. We had judges, kings, and we're in a section where kings were ruling the nation of Israel. And these prophets were coming to these kings and to the people and warning them of their sinful ways. <clears throat> There were spiritual, military, and political leaders whom God raised up as the occasion demanded. We studied about three, three kings, 120 years, Saul, David, and Solomon. Michael, in the la our last study, we spent all semester on David. And it's important, I believe, to go back in the Old Testament and read these stories over and over again and understand the nature of God. <clears throat> About 917 B.C., Israel had a civil war and divided into two nations, Israel and Judah. And that's what we're looking at today, Judah, the southern kingdom, Israel the northern kingdom. Everybody tracking so far? A little bit of review. Uh, Isaiah chapter 1 through 6, we're still in. Isaiah's ministry began. There was a national crisis in the northern kingdom. These people were already be carried away. And yet, it's, uh, it's amazing the people of Judah, the nation of Israel, uh, Judah there, that part of Israel still didn't get it, it seems to me. So that somewhere in this span time, the or span of time, the Assyrians overwhelm Israel and they start threatening Judah. And so Israel Isaiah in this book is prophesying to the southern kingdom, the people of the southern kingdom, the kings of the southern kingdom as Judah also 
is seeing repeated threats. And we looked at that a couple of lessons ago where the kings actually appeased the Assyrians for a while to hold them off. Uh, your commentary brings up this scripture from Peter. The prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men where God spake and they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So Peter's addressing a different subject, but it is very applicable here. God sent in prophets. Uh, Jeremiah was a prophet, didn't really want to prophesy. And a lot of these prophets you read into, they didn't want to go. <laughs> it wasn't a good story they, they wanted to hear about, or the people wanted to hear about, but they had to go. As Gene read in Isaiah chapter 1, and we'll cover one through six, but she read two through six. There was a complaint of the Lord against Judah for them to hear. And he's saying, I've nourished you. I brought you up. You know, I brought you out of the promised, uh, into the promised land, but yet you've rebelled against me. And again, I'm repeating a little bit here, but the ox, the donkey, they know their owner. Why aren't you responding, God says? My people don't consider. My people aren't reasoning with this at all. <clears throat> In your commentary here, they quote a commentator by the name of Briley. And he says, In Isaiah's day, although God had proven to be the gracious provider for the people many times over. They lack the perception of the ox or the donkey. It's a great irony that human beings are creatures whom God desires to have personal time with, intimate time with, a relationship with, yet alone we consistently fail to honor and respond to him. As that applies to us today, can anybody think of ways that we might fail to honor God, fail to respond to him? Any examples? When somebody cuts you off. So when, cut you off on the, when Michael cuts you off on the way to coming up to the building. Michael? Because he's in a hurry. We... we we drive up here and uh, Patty and I are both from areas of metropolitan cities. We love it here because we're not fighting traffic to get here. <laughs> but we're so blessed, aren't we, as a nation? And I was uh, listening some ideas over the holidays how you have to be, you have to appreciate things in order to understand blessings you have to appreciate things to know God and we live in a society that doesn't appreciate things until they're taken away and uh, I think we're in frightening times right now so again God says hear O heavens give ear O earth God created everything. And he's saying, listen, heaven and earth, because Judah won't hear me. They've resisted the will of God. And he considers that heaven and earth might be the jury laid out in front of his people. And God's the judge. Paul says a similar things in Romans chapter 8, verse 22. I don't know if I explored this in the commentary or I came up with this one, but Paul says, For we know the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. The creation was waiting for the deliverance. Of course, we're talking about Jesus to come. So there, there's consistency in this kind of talk. I don't know how creation groans. 
But imagine that kind of figurative language. A lot of people study poetry. I don't get it, but I do believe God's poetry is the best. And the way God puts things to us, and, and, and that's why I think of them as they're metaphors to me when I think of creation groaning and the appreciation we should have for him sending us his son that rules now over us. But Paul says, when God's people disobey, we might say there's a sense of delay in the resolution of all things. When we delay to respond to God's will, Paul's really saying here, and this is a commentary, the interests of the world is in obedience, God's creation. In your commentary, uh, they sum it up on page 21. As a sinful nation, people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, and children who are corruptors, Isaiah 1, 4. Okay, Gene, we're going to ask her to read now again. We've gotten from two to six. We're going to have her re ask her to read five and six again. Isaiah chapter one, five and six. Can you read that again, Gene? You haven't read six yet. I believe you read five before. Why should you be stricken again? You will revoke more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. Your wounds and bruises and sores, they have been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Thank you. So again, we're kind of taking the text and considering as we go along. Now Isaiah says here in chapter one, five and six, God is saying to the people, why should I? He doesn't want to stricken us anymore. He doesn't want to discipline anymore. But as, as I discipline God saying, you revolt. The more, and, and if you ever had your whole head sick, which a lot of us are going through this time of the year, it affects the whole body, he says, even down to the sole of the foot, doesn't it? And he's saying, your head, there's no soundness in it. You're not reasoning. You're not being rational. You're not considering the words that I've given you. But I wound and bruise and try to purify the sores. And you can't even bound them up with ointment. And for all this, Judah would not repent. Their sin brought with them great trouble. And this runs fluid in the New Testament where Jesus says they'd rather be like the pig and just lay in the mud than submit to the Lord. It, yes? You can take it back to the Levitical priesthood. This is where even a small sore on the skin, remember they were just go to the priest and to show themselves and the priest would determine whether they were it, it was a, a skin disease that could be leprosy and if the sore was open it was to be called a skin disease and then they were to be put out of the camp for seven days and then show themselves again and they were considered unclean during this time mm -hmm. and, and Isaiah here making an indication to them of how unclean they really are Good point. So Michael was saying that this would reckon them back to the Levitical law where they were to present themselves uh, as holy and acceptable. But if they had a skin lesion, they had to be moved out of the camp because they could become contagious. Second Chronicles chapter 2, 28 through 22 and these are listed in page 20 towards the top part of it. 
uh, I grabbed one of them. <clears throat> now in the time of distress, King Asa became increasingly unfaithful to the Lord. <clears throat> Again, King Asa is one of the kings that Isaiah is talking to or prophesying to along with the people. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and 22, it says there, chronicalizing, Chronicles means to determine these facts that even the king became increasingly, increasingly unfaithful. Easy for me to say. <clears throat> It was only by the mercy of God, he says, that they survived all. And he brings us back to the idea of Sodom and Gomorrah, where they were all annihilated, alienated, destroyed, where only a small remnant would continue on. In the midst of all this judgment, God, as Gene points out, patiently continues to uh, show mercy to Judah. They go out, I believe, and grab Isaiah chapter 53, or I can't remember if I saw that in the commentary or not, but same thing there, Isaiah says, like sheep, they've gone astray, and everyone has turned their own way, and the Lord has laid on all the iniquity on us all. So they've gone astray, and the Lord has laid their iniquity on them. They brought it on themselves. <clears throat> okay, we're going to read more scripture now. And I've got Evelyn reading Isaiah chapter 7 and 8. Again, I'm trying not to read all this in totality in the beginning. I think we kind of lose track of where we're at, so I'm trying something a little different here. So uh, we're going to ask Evelyn now to read Isaiah chapter 7 and 8. Your country is desolate, your cities burn with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Okay. So I had to read 7, 8, and 9. <clears throat> in 7 and 8, and now we're on this second section on page 22, a booth in the vineyard. And I'm trying to make this so it's a little easier to comprehend. I've gotten some feedback that I t I'm tending to lose people. So we're on that section. <clears throat> and uh, God goes on through Isaiah saying, your country has been wiped out. Your cities are burned with fire. As Michael pointed out, these things are literal. These things are happening. Strangers, which are the Syrians, are devouring you. And the daughter of Zion, who's the daughter of Zion? Children of Israel. They're left as a cottage, a booth, in a vineyard. And so your commentary goes on to break that down. A booth is something we read about in the Old Testament. Uh, a cottage, a temporary home, a lodge. These are all ideas that would give the idea that you're not where you should be. You're in some temporary spot that's going to be destroyed. Uh, my version says a garden of cucumbers. And you said, your version says melons. I believe the idea here is all these things are going to expire. Why do you exist in this way? So the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage and a vineyard, a lodge and a garden of cucumbers. And then as uh, Evelyn read in Isaiah chapter 1-9, except the Lord of hosts had left unto you 
a very small remnant. You'd have already been destroyed, he says there, like Sodom and Gomorrah. How many people were left after Sodom and Gomorrah? Anybody remember? Patty's shaking her head, no. Three? Was Lot and his wife got out with their family of how many? Three, was it three? Lot and his two daughters. Lot and his two daughters, and then Lot's wife looked back. So that's the idea of a remnant. Uh, I've done a lesson or two on remnant. That's a big word in, the test, in both testaments. Anybody know what a remnant is? Peace? Peace? Yep. In the old days, you wanted to pick out carpet. What did the carpet man do? He'd come in with a book of remnants. <laughs> Say, pick out a color, right? <clears throat> or you might go to the store and pick out a remnant and say, yeah, that might look good in my home. Let me bring it home and throw it down on the carpet for a while. <clears throat> a booth and a vineyard. <clears throat> their behavior did not meet their offerings. And God hates their empty religious ceremonies. That's what's coming up. And I believe now I ask Gene to read <clears throat> Isaiah 11 through 15. Isaiah chapter 1, 11 through 15. Can you read that? 11 through 15. Isaiah 11 through 15. I say if you can, maybe if your Bible is with you as a companion. We'll read those set of scriptures and comment on those. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifice to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of your burnt offerings, of rams and the fats of red animals. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has recorded this from your hand, to trample my courts, bring no more full sacrifices, incense, and abomination to me. Thank you. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of the assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They are trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread on your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear them. Your hands are full of blood. Thank you. Could God be any more clear here? Could he be any more direct? Does that remind us of anything that we could apply to today's worship? In fact, again, if you watch Search of the Lord's Way uh, this morning, I can never remember his name, but he commented on that. I keep thinking Mac Lyon. That's the one I used to watch. Sanders. Phil Sanders. He was talking about the same thing. Even Proverbs talks about not adding anything. Revelation talks about not adding or taking away. And here God is saying, what purpose is all these sacrifices? You, you know, you might be offering burnt sacrifices to me, but I don't delight in it if you're not obeying me. Your worship is meaningless to me. And, of course, those ideas are fluid in the New Testament, too. If we come here and we just go through the motions, what good is, is it? We're only here to please ourselves or please those around us. We're not pleasing God. He says, you spread your hands. I'll hide my eyes. Imagine that. They're praying to him and God's going like this. Literally is what he's saying. I'll not hear your prayers. I 
And so we, we see that today in today's world of worshiping God. I wonder when they're going outside the scriptures how God is accepting that or is he? Or is he hiding his eyes? Are we there to please him or to please ourselves? Sometimes people believe, they really believe sincerely that they're doing what the Lord wants them to do. Yeah. They've been following a, uh, a false teaching. So they've been deceived, actually. Even, even though their hearts are sincere, they're still deceived. God doesn't accept that. Exactly. <clears throat> they, they think they're pleasing God and they're deceived. They're not listening to God's words, they're listening to man's words, aren't they? And that's the same thing happening here. And I believe not only in their worship, but in their actions. They were only deceiving themselves. And so God says, what purpose is this multitude of sacrifices to me? Even in midst of the rebellion, Judah continued religious ceremonies and rituals to, to God. They believed, like Danny said, that they were, they were worshiping God. But God says, I will not accept it. Why are you, I might paraphrase, wasting your time? And as Michael's brought out, it took a lot of time to sacrifice a bull and goat or a lamb. Continue offering me the fat of fed cattle, they continue burning incense in their assemblies and their sacred meetings, and God was sick of them all. <laughs> Couldn't be any clearer. And that's what the bottom of page 25 says. The heads, the hands they raised in prayer, they were blood stained with wrongdoing. <clears throat> and I will ask Evelyn to read Isaiah chapter 1, 16 and 17. We're on page 24. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Thank you. So we're on the section now, sins, but you can be white as snow. As we read in the beginning, wash yourselves, ye evildoers. And that again, that's, a, that's an idea that runs through into the New Testament. But God gives them the answer. Why do you continue to rub up against the barbed wire? And he tells them how to act. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. As he says in the last part of 17. And it seems that God is addressing the nation of Israel here, specifically Judah, that not only were they committing sins and iniquity, they weren't even caring for their own. Is there a book in the New Testament that says some of the same things about the widow and the orphan? I believe that's James, isn't it? So again, these ideas, uh, God never changes and they're fluid. They're ubiquitous, ubiquitous. The Lord offers a cure. Wash your hands, make yourselves clean. Put away your evil doings from my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless and plead for the widow. In your commentary, they bring up Second or Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared in all men, teaching us 
that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appealing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all our iniquity, purity unto himself, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Just parallel to what we read. And as I was studying about this, I thought about Isaiah's short time to prophesy all this. It's very similar to us, isn't it? Because once we expire from this world, and we're all guaranteed to do that, there's no time left to act upon God's words. Hebrews says, after death comes judgment. Wash yourselves, remove the ugly deeds from my sight. God sees it. He's on the present, on the mission. Put an end to such evil. Seek to do good. And these people weren't doing any of that. <clears throat> Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. <clears throat> God had been insulted by what they're doing. And you kind of picture somebody following somebody and say, well, watch, what I, watch what I can do. Look at this. Now wait, let me show you this. And he's insulted by their by their uh, by their treatment to him and, and to his word. What was it? The, the, his word. Uh, I forgot what I was thinking. Sorry. Well, I think you're talking about they they thought they claimed to be worshiping God, but they weren't considering everything that was going on around them, even those that were defenseless. All right, we're going to read the balance of this now. We're going to ask uh, Gene to read Isaiah chapter 21 through 23. Isaiah chapter 1, 21 through 23. 24 through. 21. And then 21 through 23. 23. And that sort of ends the section that we're looking at. How faithful cities have become a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged on it. But now murderers, your silver has become dross and wine mixed with water. Your princesses are rebellious and companies of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and followers after rewards, and they do not defend the fatherless, or do they cause of the widows come before them. Therefore the Lord said, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, I will rid myself of my advisors and the vengeance of my enemies. Thank you. So as he concludes here in this section, as Isaiah concludes as we're wrapping up this study. This faithful city, this faithful nation has become a harlot. Full of righteousness and judgment, now it's, mur uh, now it's murderers. God through Isaiah is very clear here, and you can understand why some of these prophets were, and they think maybe Isaiah was sawn in half. These words were very offensive. And sometimes God's word offends us today. Not us, but our society, doesn't it? We can think of things that go on in the world today that, oh no, God wouldn't think that way. He loves me. As Patty reminds me, he loves you. He doesn't love the acts. He loved the people of Israel, but he didn't love their actions. Or he wouldn't be so patient, as Gene is saying. And your silver's become dull. Your wine's mixed with water. All these metaphors that could be actual. Your princes are rebellious. 
your companions with thieves. And everyone loveth gifts and follow after their own rewards. They want to be rewarded by themselves, God says here, instead of allowing God to reward them. And again, James says that in the first chapter, the father of life who, who bestows perfect gifts. You know, somehow we want to settle for our own. And again, he brings up the orphans and the widows here at the end. The cost of their not following God has ramifications to the innocent. Applications. God's grace reaches even me, a sinner. Obedient submission to the Lord's plan will bring forgiveness. And it's possible for us all through Jesus. <clears throat> and as we apply it today, our lives much, must match the Lord's words. Sincerity is not enough unless you're living and worshiping God's way. All right? Okay, lightning round. We're almost done. What is a prophecy called in Isaiah chapter 1-1? One, one? It's called a vision. In chapter 2, it's going to be called something different. It's going to be called his word, I believe. But here it's a vision. What did Isaiah say to animal? What did Isaiah say animals did that Israelites failed to do? Ox knows his master, donkey his owner's men. The ox knows its owner, the donkey knows his master's crib, but Israel doesn't know a thing. What happened to the cities of Judah, Isaiah 1 7, or what will happen to them? Cities burned with fire, fields stripped by porters. Yeah. These things were already going on, and they would be, uh, absolutely become more of the same thing. To what did Isaiah compare the city of Jerusalem to? Isaiah 1 8. A city under siege. A, yeah, and a daughter of Zion like a cottage left in a vineyard is a lodge in a garden of cucumbers that aren't picked, I would suggest. How did the Lord feel about the sacrifices that Judah was offering him? No value yeah, you might say I'm fed up. I'm full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of the lamb. What did the Lord do when the Judah prayed? He had his eyes and did not eat. He oh, died my, from. That's right. I'll hide my eyes from you. What did the Lord tell the people to do? When he wanted to wash their, wash and come clean, put away their evil, cease to do evil, <coughs> learn to do well, seek justice. You leave the oppressed. Yeah, exactly. And that's this week's lesson. Next week will be in lesson number four. It will be in Isaiah chapter 2, 1 through 22. Thank you.